This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Bingo! It's our Energy Policy Forum show, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And guess what? Sharon Moriwaki, co chair, co -chair. of the Hawaii Energy oh. Policy Forum, is here with us today as co host. I'm so happy about that. And we have Hawaiian Electric too. Okay, we have Brenda Morioka. He is the general man. I get this right. The general manager of the electrification of transportation at Hawaiian Electric. Yeah, just a lot of words. <laughs> just means it keeps me busy. Okay, well you can actually you can put it to music. <laughs> you want to have me try that? Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> you write the notes, maybe I'll hum along. <laughs> Jimmy Yao. He is the director of electrification of More transportation. Words. More words. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. And they know each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we're here, you know, to sort of examine the continuum of developing um, electric transportation in Hawaii. And it has become, you know, a priority or a visible priority where everybody knows and everybody talks about it. And the question is to have it settle down so that when you're out there buying your next $70,000 SUV, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you think twice and get something electric. Hopefully, right? yeah. yeah. So what's the condition of the, of the state initiative on electrifying transportation? Well, you know, there's, there continues to be a lot of discussion, right? I mean, a lot of um, people talking both at the state level, all four counties um, have entered the discussion about clean transportation. Um, and there's, there's different forms of clean transportation, and not all of it is just having to be electric because there's other types of alternative fuels that are considered clean. Um, but, you know, Hawaiian Electric's focus is on the uh, customer side where uh, we can provide a service, um, and that's on the electric side, um, so electric vehicles. And whenever people talk about electric uh, EOT or electrification of transportation, most people automatically go to, well, it's about electric vehicles or electric cars. But EOT is, is far more than that. It's, it's also about electric buses, um, electrifying the operations on our harbors and the ports, um, electrifying E equipment at the airports, you know, the ground service equipment that moves your, your baggage and the, the, the tug and toes that push in, push the, the planes. Um, but it's really looking at the, just the transportation sector because, you know, we, we talked um, in the past about how we talk about increasing our um, reliance or decreasing our reliance on imported fossil fuels, increasing our energy security, and we do that by the reduction of the use of gasoline or oil. And when people talk, look at Hawaiian Electric, it's primarily, well, how do you, you know, reduce the amount of oil that you use to make electricity? And in the big picture, that only amounts to about 28% of the total petroleum used in Hawaii, whereas 61% of the petroleum used here in Hawaii is for transportation purposes. So if we're serious about energy security, if we're serious about providing a cleaner environment by reducing carbon emissions, we really need to kind of take a step back and start talking about where we might have the most impact, and that's in the transportation sector. So Hawaiian Electric, um, re about a year and a half ago, really took that step forward. Hawaiian Electric has been working on electric vehicles for a number, almost a little over a, a decade, uh, which is also why you have Jimmy Yao here. He's, he's probably our most experienced uh, person at Hawaiian Electric working in the, in the electric vehicle field. Uh, but Hawaiian Electric made that commitment on focusing on uh, bringing the resources within the company to focus on electrification of transportation. How do we reach out to the transportation sector, which historically hasn't been a partner with the ut or the energy sector? So uh, it's kind of been nice for me to kind of marry some of my background in transportation uh, with the the energy yeah, sector. Right, it's so, perfect. It's yeah, perfect. no, it's, it's been a great experience so far. Yeah, yeah. So Jimmy, what is this about? Since you've been studying, you've been studying electric cars since 1922, was it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah. Do you see the growth and yes. progress, and what what are some? Of the well, definitely. I mean, if you look at what's happening, it's 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 been a real great growth. So the first electric vehicle, that mass-produced electric vehicle, hit Hawaii in 2011. Right? You bought your car in 2011, right? Yeah. Um, you look at it now. The state is over 7,000 electric vehicles registered. Electric. 7,000. Right? Okay. And then this year also, you saw, you see the growth pattern in just electric vehicles, but this year, hopefully you've seen the press and, and the electric buses pilot running around town. 
Um, so the sky's the limit here. Okay, there's going to be fits and starts, though, because of the you know the the money involved. In the for example, I mean, it's just a, this is just a, while you were talking, I was thinking that you know I, I first learned early on when I started getting involved with uh, the Energy Policy Forum and Chair, and I realized, and uh, this is a conversation with Peter Rusick, who taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that that the nature of uh, the, the, the utility has got to change around green energy um, in many ways, many many ways. It's it's a complete re reorganization, a re re rethinking, if you will. Um, and you know, one of the things that you have to realize is that if you take all those cars out there, there's a million cars out there, and you make them all electric, um, then pretty much, aside from the guys who have special setups on their roofs. Um, you, you're going to have to get your, your power for the car from the utility. And right. if the utility is, is burning fossil fuel, then you, you really, you know, it's a bad trade-off because you're burning fossil fuel to get the electricity. Is that really moving to green? It's not really. So what, what that means is that in this transition, in this continuum we're talking about, you have to move the generating system to green also if you want to get where you want to go. And, and this now this means that the utility more than you ever imagined has got to be green, and the utility has got to change to, you know, to wrap around these these million cars. That's what we're talking about here. This is a major right. thing. I hope you're a very young man because I think you have a, <laughs> a long chore ahead of you, Brennan. Well, I got I got three kids in private school right now, and then they got to go to college. So I, I got to be working for a long time anyway. So I'll, I'll, I'll be around. Yeah. yeah. No, but you're you're absolutely right, and and that's why electrification of transportation is just one aspect of a lot of the different things that the utility that Hawaiian Electric, Maui Electric, Hawaii Electric Light. We're all moving in the same direction to number one, achieve the 100% renewable um, portfolio uh, that the state has set for 2045. Uh, our goal is to hit that by 2040. And the utility has done what's called the grid modernization plan, which was approved by the PUC. We've submitted and gotten the PUC approval for our power supply improvement plan also, that has now been uh, renamed into our integrated grid planning process. Um, and all of that, takes into account other types of initiatives and technology. So electrification of transportation is one, because everything is based on how, do, how does the utility now, instead of burning oil to produce energy, how do we accept, either create on our own or accept from others, re clean renewable energy into the grid and service all of our customers. And so uh, electrification of transportation is one, demand response is another um, initiative and technique or technology. And then also um, distributive energy, which is a lot of your solar uh, and, and wind. Yeah, so it all plays into the transportation because Correct. If, you're, if you're feeding elect electricity back to the grid, or you know, the utility is uh, essentially getting it from homeowners or wherever these utility scale right. photovoltaic uh, arrays that are going up now, um, that is the source of power that would go to these cars, and it makes it possible. Um, so, uh, you know, I can see the whole, I can visualize the whole thing is changing. And um, um, by 2040, that's a pretty ambitious uh, goal. Yeah, we think so. And But I think everything that the utility has been doing is, is really showing the kind of commitment and progress towards those goals. And so it, it's nice to be a part of that kind of initiative. I know a lot of people talk about, well, you know, we're trying to green up transportation, green up the kind of cars that we drive, but you're still burning fossil fuels and creating carbons, uh, carbon particulates by the power that's generated in order to provide the electricity for those green cars, which is true today. But you know, as, as we continue to see the utilities, the amount of uh, renewable energies in the uh, utilities portfolio, that is quickly ramping up pretty fast. So, so that scenario, that situation where it takes, you know, dirty energy to power these cars compared to clean energy, uh, not in the not so distant future, you know, that, that argument is completely going to flip upside down. And yeah. so for us, we need to be ready for that. You know, when, when, we, when we do have a system that is uh, purely 100% renewable, um, we also want all of the other things that are tied to it. So you have to move to be on both sides of the equation. Yeah, I, I, they, yeah. you cannot do, it, it can't be done in sequence. It needs to be done concurrently and together. Um, and so that's that's how we're really attacking. This so there's just I see two things. Um, uh, one is the the Moriwaki problem, 
which we mentioned earlier, yes. which is getting a charging station in your condo or your home or in your neighborhood. Um, and I think there's, there's some obstacles to that. Uh, we can talk. We should talk about it because I, I think really it's um, it's a critical piece in this puzzle because you you got to encourage people. Okay, and one of the ways you encourage people is a lot of charging stations. And in Hawaii, we can do that. You know, Hawaii is really open to this. Not everybody, but a lot of people are open to it. And when you comp compare the number of people who are agreeable, amenable to green energy and paying for it uh, here, as opposed to the mainland, hey, on the mainland, they don't, they're not nearly as excited about green energy as we are. We are right. really the leaders by attitude, anyway. And really, that's why, you know, I mean, we, we talked about our the roadmap that we submitted to the PUC in March. And the roadmap really tried to identify many of the obstacles towards electric vehicle adoption. And because our, our initial goal is, number one, uh, in, increase the number of electric vehicles on our roads, so increase the adoption here in Hawaii, and also uh, parlay that into greater benefits and savings to all of our customers, whether you own an EV or not. And so we've identified public outreach and education as one of the major things that we need to be tackling because there's a lot of information out there that is either incorrect or just absent that people need to have in order to make more informed decisions when they're choosing to buy an EV or not. But also, uh, how do we assist government and private sector entities that are looking to convert buses to the electric buses because that there's a lot of momentum there. And then also, you know, where, where folks like Sharon who want to buy an EV or have an EV but live in a condominium unit uh, who, who can't readily or easily have access to a charging unit. And so uh, multi-unit dwellings, workplace charging are all things that we've identified as obstacles towards EV adoption where we want to work with uh, our partners um, at the state level, the county level, in the private sector on finding solutions for that. So um, that's kind of where, where we are right now yeah. in terms of trying to push these initiatives forward, but a lot of it is going to be establishing and creating those partnerships that, because uh, we're not going it's to, a, it's a really a kako thing, right? We, we're not going to be able to do it all by ourselves. Um, there's many things that we can take the lead on or we should take well, the lead on, I, but I, I we need help. I see you guys as leaders on this. Ab Honestly, absolutely. I, you know, who else, really? Uh, we, and we want to take the lead, but we also we also know that we need help. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to do it alone. We, we're going to need uh, policy reforms. We're going to need uh, people, statutes, statutes we need legislation ordinance. requiring that every new condo has uh, has has charging stations for every owner who parks there. There's a lot of discussion right now on revising building codes for especially for new construction. Um, there's talk about you know having to retrofit a lot of older stuff too. Uh, but I think we also need to approach it in a, in a more balanced way also because there are cost implications. Uh, we may have unintended consequences for various things that we think might be good. Um, so a, a healthy discussion on a lot of this is very important. We can have it and right here, Brent. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, we, we got, I got a long time. We can, we can do it. Jimmy, what do you think we need to get my wife to buy an electric vehicle? Because she's an old-fashioned type fossil fuel person. So it's, it's, it's actually really interesting. A lot of people in the EV industry say the number one way to get someone to believe an electric vehicle is get their, themselves in the driver's seat and try it. Has your wife ever driven an electric vehicle before? No. Has she been in one? I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's amazingly when they, when they get in, I think there's a misconception of what an electric vehicle is. Mm -hmm. But they're very, they're very quick. They're very quiet. Um, they're very smooth, no oil in the garage. right? They're easy to maintain. <laughs> so I, I th that's that's the number one thing to try to get. In fact, I think this weekend there's a ride and drive at Salt in Kakaako. You should bring her down. Yeah. Well, I got to go to the charity walk. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the charity walk. The visitor industry charity yes, walk right. on Saturday. You know, yeah. I hope you you there, sure. <laughs> anyway, you can always walk over to Salt. And yeah. Very, and very salt. Oh, salt. Yeah, salt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Well, I, and I think it's um, it's really interesting that the millennial generation, um, you know, they, they believe in green energy, but they don't necessarily believe in cars. So you you mm -hmm. have an interesting kind of you have different factors in play here. You have the, uh, you know, the, the, these these what do you call it car share arrangements, car share. which some millennials and, and some other people too. Not all of the whole world is millennials. <laughs> I have trouble with that, but there, there it is. There you have it. But they, you know, they like the the, uh, the sh car share thing because they don't need a car all the time, and parking is hard, and traffic is hard, and you just get it when you want it, and it's pretty appealing, assuming you can get it when you want it. 
Um, and, and I think that would be more sophisticated, there'd be more software allow you to do it. So all of a sudden, you have car ownership maybe second, second in the back seat. Uh, and then you have you know, Uber. I think Uber is a, a major force on this. I mean, some people swear by Uber, even though they're mm -hmm. under attack in the city council. Watch Bill 35. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, we'd like to put Uber out of town. Yeah. Um, but you know, Uber is a factor. It's like, sort of like car share. You don't have to own a car. I mean, some people just take Uber everywhere because it's half the price of a taxi, and it's available in one minute. It's amazing. It's like a magic wand. Um, so that's no, and then of course you have autonomous vehicles coming down the pike, despite that accident right. with whoever with that, with the, who mm. did that. Mm. Uh, I think that was maybe Uber or Tesla some accident. But <clears throat> but bottom line is that they're working hard to develop it now, uh, and they're developing software that's going to be safe and reliable. And and so uh, when you put all that together, you get cars that you don't have to own, and cars that where you can snap your finger and it's there, like in the movies and then it takes you wherever you tell it to take you. It's like miracles happening, you know, in our generation. Um, I don't know how that's going to affect this, but it's going to have some effect, yeah. Sure, and, and, that, and all of that is, is really taken into consideration as a part of our electrific electrification of transportation roadmap. Um, we, we look at uh, autonomous vehicles. We uh, are looking at our partnerships with the TNC companies like Uber and Lyft. Um, car shares needs to be a part of that discussion, and whether those those cars can be electric cars as well, and how do we how do we as a utility help service that by providing maybe public in, uh, charging infrastructure? Um, but we, we we also need to look at the broad spectrum of the demographic of mobility, right? It, it's not just about the millennials, like you say. It's about all age groups and how they choose to um, go from one place to another. So. You know, and, and just because you're older, maybe a senior citizen, that doesn't mean you can't participate in the electrification movement because that's where we have electric buses. Many seniors catch buses, uh, students catch buses. So if we can look at that kind of thing. And then, but then when you talk about the millennials, their, their, their philosophy or their culture is a little different, right? It's, it's a little bit more of the sharing environment or sharing culture where car share, uh, ride share have become more important to them, even bike share. So, uh, you know, electric bicycles are also becoming, becoming very much popular. more popular, especially on the mainland. I think you're starting to see some of it trickle down here in Hawaii as well. So, um, you know, when, when we look at what we can electrify from a transportation perspective, we're looking at the whole gamut of things. So what is the roadmap? I like roadmaps. I like plans. I'll give you I a like roadmap. A roadmap would take us to a, a, a place for rest once in a while, <laughs> like a break. Okay, so the roadmap so oh. far has taken us to a place where we're gonna oh, have are a we break. Rest now? So watch this. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii. Hi. We broadcast every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 and we highlight successful businesses in Hawaii. Hawaii has some challenges, most places do. But we have businesses here that have figured out how to make it work, and we learn their secrets, and we learn how they have made it successfully in Hawaii. Occasionally, we'll have organizations that come on and explain how they help these businesses to be successful. Uh, and we find that there's an awful lot of resources out there available to anybody in business to help them do better. So please tune in every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 here at the Think Tech Studios and get educated. Oh, that was restful. <laughs> that was our break. Now we're back to Hawaii, the state of clean energy by the Energy Policy Forum with Brennan Morioka, Jimmy, Jimmy Yao, and also Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair, co-host. So you had some questions before the break. I did. And uh, could, could you I proceed just, with that, yeah, Ms. Like, co-chair over like, here? I like, sure. I like roadmaps. I like planning ahead so that you know what you need to get 
to where you want to go. So I'd like to know what is your roadmap, who was involved in it, and where is it, where is it supposed to go? What is the destination for your roadmap? Well, and, and the roadmap is really the result of a lot of collaboration by a number of stakeholders. Um, actually, when we, when, when we do different presentations about electrification of transportation, one of the slides we like to show is one with all the different logos of all the different entities and businesses that were actually a part of our workshops, one-on-one um, -on -one meetings. And so, and, and we started uh, late last year and started the process to really get feedback uh, we went in with with almost a blank sheet of paper. I mean, we kind of had some of, some ideas of what we thought we mm. wanted in there, or you know, of our perception of what the challenges were. Um, but we really wanted our partners to feel like they were the ones helping us develop it from scratch. And so, um, we, we we had a, a big workshop in November where we had almost a mm. hundred participants from a variety of of sectors: energy sector, uh, utility sectors car manufacturers, a lot of in the transportation and, and, uh, sectors. And so we had a really good dialogue and, and we really asked the questions about what do you think needs to happen in order for greater adoption of electric vehicles to occur. And when we say vehicles, we're not just talking about just cars, we're talking about buses or larger mm. vans and that kind of things. And so um, we worked through it um, through the end of the year and submitted it in March. Uh, came out with a number of, of really telling things was uh, electrification of transportation number one helps in assisting the state achieve 100% RPS by uh, helping with greater integration of renewable energy into our system. Um, the second one is it helps to reduce or reduce our dependency on fossil fuels and provides a cleaner environment uh, because the more electric vehicles we have on the road the mm. less uh, carbon emissions the less fuel we use therefore you have greater dependent and uh, greater uh, energy security by less importation of, of fossil fuels and keeps it lets, lets us keep a lot of the money here as well, right? Mm. We talked a little bit about how much money mm. actually goes or is exported out of the state mm. just to purchase um, speaking fuel. Speaking of money, you know, I, I don't think there are enough charging stations. And I think charging stations ought to be a profitable investment. In other words, uh, if I have or buy a gas station, I should put a charging station on my gas station. It's, there's a lot of points around the city, the mm -hmm. state, where gas stations could serve the function of being, you know, both. Um, and the question is, you know, can I do that and, 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 and make, a, make a return on my investment for the charging station, which is going to cost some money. I mean, not only in the apparatus, the devices, but in wiring it, I suppose, and getting the power. So um, I've always felt that there should be some kind of thing in the legislature or in, in in, in the business practice in the state, maybe something the utility could actually encourage somehow, where I could go with my buddies and form a, a Hui or a Tanamoshi and I, and, and buy a lot and either have an existing gas station on it or not. And then I go and I invest in charging stations on that location. Now, at first, I may not make any money at all, but if there are more than, what, 7,000 electric vehicles that need a charge, as time goes by, as we get closer to 2040, I'll, I'll make mm -hmm. more money. Um, and, uh, if, if, you know, I mean, there's going to be competition, too, you know, because the guy in the next block, I suppose he could charge less than me and, right. and so forth. There's a, whole, there's a whole range of possibilities here. But, but merely to have them every, you know, five miles is really not enough to encourage me and my wife to feel really comfortable in driving an electric car around, around town. I not only want to have no range anxiety, I want to be happy. <laughs> I, want, I want to feel that I'm covered on every block, like, like with a gas station. So what can we do? Can we make a business model, a plan, um, an incentive, an encouragement for people um, to, to give them mm -hmm. uh, you know, some return on their investment? Well, I think it's kind of interesting, the analogy of gas station to electric vehicles. So first, there, there's some analogies and there's some that aren't. So the interesting thing about electric vehicles is, as opposed to a gas car, you have to go to a gas station and pump the car. So with an electric vehicle, you can basically charge your car anywhere there's electricity. So there's a little bit of a paradigm shift there. So not every single person needs to go to some public destination to charge the car. There's a flexibility that it can charge at home. So most people right now charge at home. And that's a, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So the business case is a little bit different. But similar to us, when we're putting in our DC fast charging stations for the public use, um, and similar to how 
the gas station models are. So gas stations now, they don't really make that much money off selling gasoline. It's really the synergy between the gasoline and, and the mini mart that's paired with it. Mm. So some of the things that we try to look for are locations where there's a strip mall or something like that to give someone something to do. Because mm -hmm. unlike, unlike gasoline, you know, you, gasoline, you, you're, you're there for five minutes and then you're gone. For the electric vehicle charging, you're there for, like, for fast charging, you're there typically maybe half an hour. So we would look for those opportunities. Um, it is kind of interesting. So there are certain companies that have looked at electric vehicle charging and how it brings in customers. One of the big ones international or nationally is Target. So hey, Target, Target has store. yeah Target stores. Yeah. So they pair with a certain charge station manufacturer because they know for every minute a customer is in their store how much revenue it brings in. They also know hmm. typically how long a customer stays in that store. So what they do is they provide. Two, two hours of free charging if you if you want to charge because they'll bring in a certain amount of revenue. After two hours, they figure you're no longer there. If your car's still there, then they charge you a certain amount of money because they figure you're at the other store. That's a good idea to, <coughs> to control abuse. Right. So there's, it's, it's a little bit different, I think, when, when you look at the business case for electric vehicle charging. Yeah. There's this young, young group of guys uh, that, that have, a, I forget the name of this operation, but they make a deal with the, with the um, shopping oh, Volta, centers. Volta. Isn't it Volta? Volta, the one where right. you put Volta, ads Volta, on thank the... You. We've had them yeah, on the show. Yeah, now. we have. Right. And smart guys, and they know how to make a deal with the shopping mm -hmm. center, and then you put if the you're ads, shopping there, you, you can park and there. you can yep. charge free, and nobody really stops you from leaving your car there all day. You know, and and the um, they they get their revenue out of the this gizmo Ads. where there's yeah. advertising. They right. get advertising revenue revenue, and they they pay for the uh, the electricity. But I mean, there's lots of different business models, and I think um, you know the more models, the more people, the more investing, the more charging stations, the better we'll all feel. Even if we're oversupplied, at least for a while, you know. So why don't the stations. service stations? You have the problem is space. So if you had a service station with gasoline on one side, and they may, in 2045, go out of business with gas, then why not start developing EVs somewhere on the station mm -hmm. lot right. so that you, know, you can transition into right. electricity? And actually, there is, there is a, a big movement by many of the petroleum uh, companies to look at renewable and clean energy as well. Many of them have their own actual clean energy arms. And so... Uh, they have begun some conversations with um, with us, and so we we have some discussions with them on some of their specific um, uh, locations. Uh, I think some of them are they're they're seeing the the change and the reduction in amount of oil or gasoline that people mm. are going to be purchasing in the future, and they want to start changing their business model today. But also, like Jimmy said, you know, they also understand the behavior of electric vehicle drivers, and they are going to be parked there for a certain period of time. I'm probably not going to want to park someplace that doesn't have anything for me to do. So mm. I'm going to go and find a public charger that maybe mm. has a retail store, like, mm. a, like a Target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's called the yeah. Starbucks model. Yeah. And so many of the um, gasoline stations who, who do have uh, these mini marts, they are looking at what they can do to uh, mm. enhance that experience and then and mm. put a, a charger there. Because if they're going to start attracting people to charge at their gas yeah, station instead of fill gas yeah. you know they want them much like target thinks that once uh, once you get into my store you're going to be spending money same thing for the the yeah. gas station right there you're not going to be buying gas but you're going to be spending mm. money on twinkies or car yeah. you know whatever whatever you're going to a mm. uh, hot dog mm -hmm. or something the funny thing is that technology will always you know change and move and get better hopefully um so it's really interesting you could get into that model and you can have the starbucks kind of experience uh, on the notion that it takes 20 minutes or something for a fast charger to, to fill up oh, your yeah. tank. Uh, and then they could come out with a charger that would charge you in 30 seconds. <laughs> and, and, and now you, you, have, you have the rug pulled out from under you on that model. But I don't think it's yeah. going to happen anytime soon. Well, it it might actually like, happen a yeah. lot sooner than yeah. you think. Yeah, right. I mean, our, our fast chargers, like Jimmy said, charges a Nissan Leaf in about 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, they're, the Europe and some places on the mainland are having them down to 10 minutes. Wow. Maybe their goal is to get it down to five. So what that does to the utility, we, we kind of need to figure that out too. So for us, it's a matter of understanding what the market is, where it is, and then how can we better plan yeah. to service our customers. Yeah. 
Well, that's the role of the utility in a, yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a whole initiative that's going green, is to follow the technology, because it's always changing. Not only well, and the, cu and the customer, and the range anxiety. So, so even another um, business you could start is a roving EV station, right? Because when you're on the road, there's, AAA doesn't come, you know, doesn't come to help you, right? right. And when I call, I said, oh, no, we don't do that. <laughs> but if you had a truck that goes around and it plugs you in, you charge for that. But, you know, at least you're not stranded right. on the highway. Yeah. There's nothing you can do. But right? Didn't you install something called Moby? Uh, I, I don't know if it's experimental or what. Moby is a, is a product of, of FreeWire, and it's, it's a mobile u, uh, charging unit. Right now, we have one at um, the Airport Trade Center. Uh, it's it's a slower charge right now. Um, it used to have a, a faster charging unit there, but uh, they took it back for to to modify it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there the technology for that exists. That kind of technology is actually really rapidly changing and growing as well. Because mm. um, the one that's out there is a fairly big unit. I mean, mm. it, it's almost the size of a of a you know gas dispensary thing. Oh. Um, so it's pretty oh, big. Hard to carry it around. I mean, but, but there are ones that are more like a, a five gallon or, or a, a two gallon mm. um, uh, fuel canister that most people are used to carrying around. And so hmm. that'll give you like a quick charge just to, enough to get to you, get you home yeah, so you yeah. can charge your car if it's, yeah. if it's run out of battery. Put it so, in your trunk. Yeah, so yeah. technology is mm. changing and so that means business opportunities also change as well. Oh, exciting. It is exciting. It is. And the question is to keep people advised of this so that they can they can change their attitude and uh, they can, you know, get on get on the road. So um, uh, you were talking in the break, I guess, it was about uh, um, dealing with the public and trying to take the temperature of the public. What is the temperature of the public? And what do you think the, the pressure points are? You know, the, 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 the arguments or the actions you can take. For example, if I gave you a bigger credit, a state a, re, a resumption of the state credit for buying electric cars, I'm sure you'd see the charge shoot mm -hmm. right up. Right. Um, even my wife, even. Uh, <laughs> but, but we'll get her there, Jay. We'll get, we'll get her there. Yeah, have her on the yeah, show. We are, yeah. Sure, we will. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think? What do we have to do to, you know, what's the condition of the public, and what are we, what are the pressure points? I think there's two. One is obviously price. And the second one is this concept of range anxiety, how far can you drive? So mm -hmm. as far as price is going, prices are getting lower. You know, Hawaiian Electric are rolling out programs through us to lower the price. There's there's rebates and, and such through through the dealership through the car manufacturer to lower that initial price. Um, the prices are going down. So the industry is saying that in the year 2025 there should be price parity between an electric vehicle and, and a gas car. So at some point that, that whole issue hopefully should go away. Um, the the mm -hmm. second part now is then the range anxiety. And I think some of that is misconception. So some of the earlier cars, they have a little bit lower range. Um, it's still probably adequate for most people in Hawaii. But now, so Brandon just recently bought a 2018 car and it has 150 miles of range. Oh, wow. So for most people, that's a that's, leap. A yeah. leap, a leap yeah. Wow. Right. I love, I love the car. Well, it's hugely much more range yeah, than before. Range, 150 yeah. compared to the early Leafs, oh, which nice. was about what 77 miles. Um, you know, Twice yeah. So, I, so I really don't have to charge every day. I can charge once every three or four days and still have more than adequate charge um, to get wherever I need to go during yeah, the day. And I live Kaneohe, so. You know that's you know it's it's not just a simple drive around town. It's better than my cell phone. Yeah, better than my watch <laughs> even. So they can't retrofit the old cars. You have to just buy a new car. No, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even the batteries that you put in. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Sharon, I I hate to tell you this. I always hate to tell you this, but I do tell you this pretty much every week. It's time for oh. us to go now. <laughs> oh, it went too and, fast. And it's your job as a co-host to summarize everything that Brendan and Jimmy <laughs> have said and, and, and try to, you know, bring a message out of it. Go, go now. Oh, well, I'm really excited because I was there in the first time, you know, putting it in a condo. Uh, but with having a road map and doing the kinds of things you're doing and really bringing transportation into um, clean energy. You folks are in the leadership role, so I, I really think, Jimmy, thank you for staying the course, <laughs> and, and Brennan for joining as general manager to bring the businesses involved, because unless the businesses from all the sectors, I was going to ask you about trucking industry as yep. well, is like how do you bring that so everybody is, is comfortable driving an EV and We're actually speaking that. at the Hawaii Transportation Association's oh, annual good. conference. Uh, 
um, to talk to all the, the heavy truckers oh, about good. those yeah. opportunities in the yeah. future. Because yeah. they're the heavy users. Yep. And, yeah. yep. But thank you. And, and you have to come back, give us updates as you go along. Anytime. Absolutely happy to come back. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Well, Brenda thank Marioka, you. Jimmy Yao. Thank, thank you so much, Aloha. you guys. And thank Aloha. you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. Aloha. 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 Aloha.